All right, we are going to get started with our final panel of the day here in just a minute. Um, as everyone is getting settled and coming back to their tables, I actually wanted to share an idea that Alyssa uh, from Minneapolis just shared with us. Um, so she was talking about our, our somewhat failed attempt on the post-it notes. One suggestion she had is that she said that a lot of them, uh, that she and others have had a lot of questions. Um, and we haven't had a lot of time for questions in our sessions. So if you would like to use the post-its to share specific questions, either about evaluation or about randomization that you would like us to address, please feel free to do that. Um, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have a poster session where a number of you will be presenting your posters. As a part of that, we're also going to have kind of a JPAL help desk um, that's just open office hours for any kinds of questions that you're interested in exploring in more depth. So if you want to put on our radar the kinds of things that you'd like to discuss, um, this would be another way to do that if you'd like to. In any event, I'm now very excited to introduce um, our last panel. So Julia Chabrier is a senior policy manager with JPL North America, and she has been managing the state and local innovation initiative from the start when it was at the idea stage. So she is, has been an amazing um, thought partner and leader in all of this work. And before coming to JPL, um, she brings really interesting experience working in Massachusetts at the state level in the executive office, managing some of the first pay for success projects there, um, and also brings a deep experience in education policy, including working as a public school teacher. So I'd like to welcome Julia, who will then introduce our panel. Thank you. Um, so I am very excited to introduce the final panel of the day. Uh, we have represented here government leaders from the city, county, and state level. Um, hope, hopefully they're sitting in that order. Um, and they're gonna share examples of their work using data and evidence to inform decision making. And I think um, in doing so, they're gonna touch on many of the themes that we've spoken about today, um, particularly related to how we can build systems and cultures and relationships that go beyond individual projects um, and that make this kind of work sustainable over time. So um, I'm excited to introduce Anjali Trainani, who's uh, coming to us from the city of Philadelphia, where she's the director of policy for Mayor James Kenney. Um, the city of Philadelphia was one of the first partners selected through our state and local innovation initiative, um, and they uh, have successfully launched a randomized evaluation of their Work Ready Summer Youth Employment Program. Um, and Anjali also leads GovLab PHL, which is a multi-agency team focused on developing innovative and evidence-based practices across city government. Um, and seated next to her is Carrie Chihak, who comes to us from King County, Washington, uh, where she is the Chief of Policy for County Executive Dow Constantine. Um, and King County is another one of our partners through the State and Local Innovation Initiative, where we're partnering on a number of evaluations. Um, during the 2017 to 18 academic year, Carrie is a resident um, was in residence as a fellow at the Center for Applied Behavioral Sciences nearby at Stanford. Um, and then finally, we have uh, Mike Wilkening, who is the Undersecretary of the California Health and Human Services Agency, where he's worked since 2008. Um, and at JPAL, we've really benefited from having uh, conversations with Mike and learning from his experience working in state government, and particularly his leadership um, on issues related to open data and data sharing. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to Anjali first. Um, and then we'll have each of the panels uh, present and then have some time for questions at the end. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm excited to be here. My name, again, is Anjali Chinani, and I serve as Director of Policy for Jim Kenney in the city of Philadelphia. Um, just a little bit of background. I uh, came into this role uh, two years ago when he came into office in 2016, and prior to that, I uh, served for Councilwoman Janie Blackwell, so the legislative branch in the city of Philadelphia for 10 years and started my um, work with the city as an intern um, back in 2003. Um, so in February of 2017, uh, we decided to launch a multi-agency team called GovLab PHL. And there was a handout earlier today, Results Fair America recently published a case study on our work. Um, so if you get a chance, please do read that. It, it summarizes um, four or five of the experiments that we've done in city government in the past year, and a little bit more about the initiative, 
how we choose projects, what the challenges are that we're addressing, and really how we are building this capacity in the city. Um, so GovLab, again, is a multi-agency team, and it's led by the mayor's policy office, so my team and myself, and then we have champions of, it's really people who are um, looking to build evidence-based programs or increase the use of data in everyday decision-making across the city. So we have our um, revenue department, our Office of Open Data and Digital Transformation, and I won't read all of these departments, you can see them up here, but all of these departments in their own way are doing different things. And so a concrete example is that the Office of Open Data is using service design methodology to redesign the city's website. It's the front door to city services, using that, you know, using service designers, content strategists to really redesign and ma make the website easier to navigate. So they're very, um, already very engaged in wanting to do research and wanting to use a rigorous process to understand what are the barriers people are facing and how can we test what's working and what's not working. So we have three focus um, areas for GovLab. The first is that we want to create learning opportunities for city employees so that they can start thinking about their work in a different way. Um, and so we've started the PHL Government Book Club. Um, this is led by um, our colleagues in the Department of Revenue. We've read Moneyball for Government. We've read Nudge. Um, over the holidays, because people get really busy, we decided to do a set of three podcasts, um, so under an hour and have people listen, and then we um, schedule two or three times in our innovation lab for whoever can come. Either there'll be a lunchtime session and an evening session, and we've gotten people from upper level management to frontline folks to people that are out in the field. So we've had people from our parks and recreation department come and really just engage in conversation, and we encourage people to come even if you haven't finished the book. Um, the second thing is, is that we're piloting programs and program modifications through the Philadelphia Behavioral Science Initiative. So this concretely is the mayor's office pairing an academic researcher with a city agency. We're together designing a randomized control trial to test a specific either messaging experiment or in one case we're randomizing inspections with the health department to see if it changes behavior. And seeing that project through from beginning to end is, is the role that we're playing there. And then lastly, we want to try to engage the public as much as possible. And so one example of that is that we had a 10-month speaker series on human-centered design from February until December of last year. We're now designing our insights booklet from that. But we had speakers from all over the country come in and talk about how service, service design methodology can be used in particular programs when you're thinking about the, your goals or how do you really um, you know, use that to improve what you're doing or to make it easier for the public to access. Um, so just the, the example of the three podcasts we read was um, an interview with David Yoakum from the lab at DC, um, Hidden Brain, and then another one called Two Guys on Your Head, which was really funny. Um, and these slides are going to be shared with you, so you can certainly listen to those yourself as well. The, Behavioral Science Initiative has really been our biggest program um, and the one that's been the most successful and it's also the one that Results for America did a case study on and, and we don't have funding for this. So we're different in other labs in that we are using a partnership model to make these projects happen. Um, it's a mutually beneficial partnership between academic researchers. We're lucky in Philadelphia to have so much talent, so close, you know, so nearby. And we are using existing resources in city departments. So we're not asking um, you know, our departments to, to embed a new project in there. We're using existing dollars. So there's already been this explosion of research around the country around behavioral insights and, and how people are making the decisions they're making. Um, and we as a city government across the city are using more evidence-based or wanting to use more evidence-based methodologies. And then so we have our uh, mayor championing this and we also have departmental champions. So I think especially for their researchers, they get a chance to test theories that they've been working on in a real life context. And they have an opportunity to bring their students along in that learning. And so I think that even though they're not getting paid, they're spending a lot of time on the phone with us and in meetings. Um, but they're really getting to use those theories in a concrete way. 
Am I at time or? Okay, sorry. Um, and some examples of the behavioral toolkit that we've been using, and I am not a behavioral scientist, so I've learned a lot in the past two years about this. Um, we tried uh, testing lottery-based financial incentives with teachers in the school district. We wanted to encourage increased response um, rates for a district-wide survey, and so we tested um, saying you might have a chance to win a $100 gift card, one in 15 chance to win a $100 gift card for yourself. Um, if you complete the survey or you have a chance to win a, a $100 gift card for your classroom and we tested those different um, incentives. We actually found with that particular study that the results were null. They both increased um, the uh, completion of the survey so the school district benefited by that and we, we um, found it very interesting. Um, we also have tested social and personal rewards with our Eclipse online uh, license renewal system. So the city invested a lot of money in this new Eclipse system and we wanted to encourage license holders to first register themselves online and then renew their licenses online. And we tested different messages that this is gonna save you time and money if you renew online versus it's gonna save the city time and money if you do that. Um, and so then, you know, social norms We've, we've read a lot about people care about what their neighbors think you're doing um, and what you, you know what, what you think your colleagues are doing. And so we've tested things like that. And then gain versus loss, we did a specific experiment with our own city employees um, with our health and wellness program. We tested, we sent out postcards and said, um, if you don't participate in the wellness program, then you might lose $500 versus if you don't participate in the wellness program, if you do participate, you'll gain 500. Um, and then we tested plan making. So for some <clears throat> postcards, there was a checklist that encourages people that you've made it so far in the program and you just have three more steps to go. Um, so those results are still being um, analyzed. I think this is uh, the slide that everyone can resonate with. The challenges that we're facing is really making programs and services as responsive as possible to our residents and the people that we're serving. We also generally have a lack of capacity to do this kind of research in government. So having students come in from this for the summer and help us write our research protocols has been has made a monumental difference for us because none of us have the time to sit and do that. But it's so important to have all of that written down um, and really to embed an experiment. We rely on our academic partners who do that in day in and day out to really walk us through. Um, the, the design concept of an experiment, but then all the questions that we have when we actually start to implement it, and we want that resident to get that randomized letter um, to really talk through that. And then the, another challenge is really, we didn't have access to evidence on behaviors and what, how we're influenced by our context. It existed, we just didn't know to look for it. And I think through what the lab at DC has done and Ideas 42 and all of the other people um, we've really gotten gotten more um, gotten access to that. So our approach, I've talked a little bit about this. We have a centralized government research partnership model um, where we will identify a question that's associated with a key behavior. So that could be an enrollment challenge that we're having in a program that you know the eligible population for whatever reason is not applying for this for X program. Um, we'll partner the city agency with a researcher. And we've been very cognizant to try and find researchers that are interested in answering the city's questions. There are other partnerships that have not worked out. If a researcher is coming to us with their own agenda, we try to meet both needs. Um, but we really try to have researchers that want to answer the city's pol you know, pressing policy questions. Um, some agencies are happy to have researchers publish the work after. Other agencies are not comfortable with that. So the mayor's office is really involved in having those difficult conversations and trying to navigate um, those relationships. Once we've partnered the academic partner with the agency, we'll identify, you know, what is the actual behavior? Can the city measure it? Are we already measuring it? What is the frontline staff gonna have to do to actually implement this? And all of those questions take two, two to three months to really get a clear um, sense if this is possible. And then we co-design whatever the pilot is gonna be. Throughout the, throughout the process, we always deal with implementation challenges. Um, I can give you an example. We, we've done a project with it trying to increase 
recycling and reduce littering. <coughs> We've done three experiments, and one of those experiments was to test bin placement on commercial corridors. And so that involved, um, of course, the researcher helping us design an experiment, talking to CDCs in the area and having them see if they could hold uh, trash bins for us so that we could put them out on certain days. And the idea was that two commercial quarters out of the four would get more trash bins for a week, two weeks. Um, two would get some taken away, and then we would switch. And, and we were measuring the rates of recycling and litter with this, the Philadelphia Litter Index um, and seeing if there was a difference. Um, and one set of bins actually got delivered to the wrong place the day that the experiment was supposed to go. It was delivered a mile down the road. And, um, you know, what do you, what do, you do in, that, in that? And so we, it, it requires you to kind of jump in and, and start talking to the city agency and the contractor who made the delivery and then the researcher and say, does this mess up the experiment? Have we just ruined everything? And all of those questions are constantly coming up. Um, and so it's, you know, I think I'm jumping a little bit, but when you, when you get the results, even if they don't end up being exactly what you wanted them to be, the, this partnership and having those kinds of difficult conversations has really created some really enriching relationships for us with both academics and every level of um, operations in, in city government. Um, so that's kind of the implementation of the pilot. We, ha we generally rely on our academic researchers or students to do the analysis of the data. We do that with the data sharing agreement. Um, we are lucky to have one person that we work with in the law department that manages external re research partnerships. Um, <coughs> and, and then we'll share the results largely with policymakers, with the public, um, and with, with city agencies. I talked about some of these already, so I'm uh, gonna just skip through this. I think one exciting um, piece about the licenses and inspections were you know, the idea was to send early notifications to these license holders, and we tested four different letters. Um, everyone who received a letter, if we were to group them all together, it increased the response rate by 19% versus the control group that didn't receive a letter, but they were hearing about Eclipse and, and kind of registering on their own. Um, we also had a null result with our bike share experiment. Um, so we wanted to test the use of coupons to see so bike share is, is seasonal. It gets very cold in Philadelphia. You know, riding bikes kind of drops. And we wanted to see that when it's time to start renewing your pass, generally people will start renewing passes in June or in July when it's really hot. And we wanted to get people to start renewing their passes in March or, or April. So we sent these coupons. Both of them worked. When people got a coupon in their email, they capitalized on it. And so there was you know, just a, a slight difference with the 50% off coupon. I have one minute left, so I wanna go into tips for how to replicate this. I think one of the things that we've learned is that champions are so essential. It can't just come from the top. It can't just come from the ground up. It's really about building support for something like this from the mayor, from the policy director, from deputy commissioners, from sanitation workers that are actually out there distributing the recycling bin and making sure every bin has a lid and, and um, it takes that. I think conversations are also key. When we initially started this, there were certainly departments that were weary. Um, you know, we've done this before or um, not sure if this is gonna work. And so having those conversations with researchers in the room at times, sometimes having them not in the room is really key. Trust has also been um, important. Uh, I think I found that in some cases, some city employees had a distrust of researchers and through conversations and, and taking another chance and, and kind of building that trust between uh, two populations that sometimes have different varying interests. Um, exposure also encourages engagement. Through the Results for America study, the state treasury office has reached out to us and, and may want to do an experiment around um, a children's savings account program, which is really neat. So we're meeting with them in a couple weeks. Um, process proves positive. So. As I said, even though the results in some cases have not turned out to be exactly what we were hoping for, um, the process from beginning to end has really brought so many people together from, from varying sectors, um, from various departments, that it's really been a very positive experience for us. And then lastly, mistakes happen. Um, we all know that you know practice and policy, sometimes there's a gap. Same thing with designing an experiment and 
and what we think it's going to be, and then when you actually start to get out there and doing it, it, it's, um, it gets difficult to implement. Um, but we, you know, as a team, you come back together and see how you can kind of navigate those challenges. I think, I think I'll stop there. I think I'm at my 10 minutes. Okay, hi everybody. How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right. Um, I am really thrilled to be here. I am temporarily living right up the road, and I was so excited to walk in and see my team from King County today and be able to represent a little bit of their great work here. And I was also really excited about um, just the title of um, this shows you how much a ner of a nerd I am, the title of J-PAL's convening, that it's Evidence-Informed Decision-Making. Informed and decision making are, are two really key words for me, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And um, Melissa earlier today posed that existential question of what is evidence informed decision making, and I'm going to take probably the very a very overly ambitious attempt to answer that for us today. I'm going to start with um, three provocative examples mm -hmm. and test you a little bit on those, and then. Um, try to engage you a little bit in an expanded definition, and then I want to talk a little bit about our best starts for kids working in King County as a case example. So I'm going to start with um, kind of these examples of how we're, you know, we've, evidence-informed decision-making has almost become a fad, uh, which is great. We're, sp we're, spreading, we're spreading the news and the love, um, but that means it's not always applied in exactly the way we want to see it applied. So I've changed the names here to protect the innocent. And uh, these slides are just a dramatization of actual real um, events. <laughs> so our first example is um, in evidence-based, in, in evidence of informed decision making, we want to apply um, the existing evidence base. And what are the steps that we go through to do this? I want you to tell me if you've seen this happen before. So first we decide on the program or the provider we want to fund, and then what do we do? We find a study that supports that result, and then we implement, right? Has anybody seen this? <laughs> I've seen this so many times, right? Um, second example around, we want to make sure that we're rigorously evaluating, and you ask people, are you doing rigorous evaluation? They say, yes, absolutely, we're doing all these randomized control trials. Um, so you select a program on which to run an RCT, and this is a little bit more complicated process. There's two steps now. So you get the results, you evaluate them, you get quote unquote good results, and you congratulate yourself and you publish broadly. You get quote unquote bad results, and what do you do? You explain why that RCT could have possibly applied to the program that you were actually evaluating. And then what's weird about this is that regardless of A or B, you continue or expand the program, right? Has anybody seen this? I've definitely seen this. OK, a third example, um, trying to nudge behavior. So uh, we conduct an RCT to determine which message is going to work better. And then um, we use the results of, of which message we find works really well to expand that program using that best messaging. And then we find out that we're not actually getting the outcomes we expected, and why would that be? Any guesses? Because we didn't really evaluate the underlying program, right? We just evaluated the, um, the, the messaging. So I want to encourage us to um, think about some of these barriers to applying evidence-informed decision-making. We, we've all seen them. The evidence doesn't exist. Evidence isn't really necessarily transparent. Um, we don't often see null results published, so we often don't see kind of the um, evidence of, of things that don't work. Um, evidence is often really conflicting or not clear or it applies to a very specific set of conditions. And the thing that I want to concentrate on is we don't generate or apply evidence in a, in a, in a more strategic decision-making process. And so I want to uh, focus us a little bit on that. So this is a really common management model in the public sector, plan, do, check, adjust, right? And what a lot of times we're doing is putting all of our evidence-informed decision-making eggs down in that basket of check, right? We focus on, on the rigorous evaluation. And if we're really, really great at this, we maybe review published evaluation results as we're doing our strategic planning. So I want to focus us on maybe testing out an expanded view of evidence-informed decision-making. And here's my proposed definition. 
And at some point, I want to get feedback from all of you about this. Um, not as I'm talking right now, but uh, either during cocktails or you can email me. So it's really thinking about an entire cycle. So that whole plan, do, check, adjust cycle where we're using a bunch of business competencies so that a whole bunch of people, not just policymakers, um, but implementers, our communities, our partners, are systematically able to use data and evidence um, at, each, at each decision point in the, in the process. So if you think about that and you think about the cycle, um, these are just some examples of the tools that we can apply. So, so strategic planning, really thinking about how we bring evidence and decision making into that part of the cycle. Human-centered design, you heard Anjali talk a little bit about that. Creating our theory of change, doing social science type research. Um, you, you can see the different tools that we have here. And then at every stage of this cycle, we really want to use results-based accountability, root cause analysis, uh, community involvement, paying attention to equity considerations mm -hmm. is really important. And then, of course, all of the data infrastructure stuff. And I would love, again, to have your feedback about what are the other tools we apply at these different stages of the, of the cycle. So in King County, um, we have one, I think, really good example of how we've done this with our Best Starts for Kids program. And there are a couple of handouts at the, I think at the table outside, um, about Best Starts for Kids and, ha and how we've done this. And uh, just to orient you a little bit, Best Starts for Kids is a voter-approved initiative. It's investing $65 million a year, so that's, you know, pretty big investment, uh, to build on the strengths of families and communities. And it's outcome-oriented. The funding um, falls along those three outcome lines. And yay, everybody applaud 5% for data and evaluation. Ooh. <laughs> Built right into the levy. Um, and really, the, um, the work that we did to develop Best Starts for Kids um, is really that full cycle approach to evidence-informed decision making. So we started with our big strategic goals. Um, these are three of the, the strategic goals of our county executive, uh, Dow Constantine, and building equity is one of them. And we started with the question of like, what's the game changer for that, for that goal? How are we going to look back 10 years from now and see that we made a difference. And so we started doing a lot of internal research, looking at the outcomes we had in our community. And we studied a whole bunch of different kinds of outcomes, and they're very differential, according to the uh, place where you live in King County, and also by your race and your income, as you can imagine. And we also evaluated our existing county investments, and we found that we were investing a whole lot in late stage crisis intervention, and not very much in prevention. So we started thinking about prevention, a prevention levy, and what could that look like, rebalancing that portfolio. We started doing a bunch of external research. And this is not just looking at what, what are the randomized control trials out there for how you improve equity. I can assure you there really aren't any. But really thinking more about social science research and brain science research. Um, and these are, are two examples. And pulling together experts, academic experts and other experts, community experts in our, in our region. Defining an outcome, our outcomes and theory of change was really important. Um, so that you really know, you know, you, you have a set of outcomes that you're trying to get to, and then what's your theory about how you're going to get there? And that helps you define the strategies that you're going to implement and what you're going to do. But what's also really important uh, beyond what you're going to do is how you're going to do it. So really developing, we spent a lot of time thinking about processes to support, um, to support those outcomes we're trying to get to. And I'll just, I'll, I'll point out just a couple of them. Um, Interdepartmental collaboration. So when we think about um, improving outcomes for very young kids in our county, there's not just one department that's responsible for that. And so we really had to think hard about how do we organize internally to create that kind of interdepartmental collaboration to get to those outcomes. And that's also really influenced then how we think about how we engage with the community and with external partners as well. And of course, um, data is super, super important, outcomes-based co contracting, and just that kind of partnership model of being in this together um, with, with the community is really key. 
So kind of putting that, that process all together, we really started back in 2013. Um, we did the research really for, you know, kind of, you know, a year and a half, two years, got a conceptual proposal, an outcome for a ballot proposal. The voters uh, approved it in um, uh, November 2015. We took a year to develop our implementation plan that would be really be clear about exactly what we were going to do. Then developed an evaluation and performance management plan under June's leadership, um, which is really kind of a learning agenda. What do we need to learn about? Um, and then our first annual report talking about what we've actually achieved. Um, and, and this timeline is going to go on, right? So um, in, uh, in 2021, our voters are going to have to re-up this levy. It was a six-year levy. And oftentimes I talk about uh, Best Starts for Kids as being a major pay for success project where the voters are really our, our investors. And if we can't show results by 2021, I can assure you they're not going to renew the funding. Um, so the message here, and at the risk of, of being <laughs> accused of using MLK to sell data and evidence, um, the arc of history is long, but it does bend towards uh, uh, data and evidence. And um, this is actually a picture from um, the lobby of the county courthouse, which is um, embedded in stone in the lobby of the, of the March on Washington. So um, I will leave you with that, and I look forward to more conversation with you and uh, questions. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Oh, okay, coffee's needed. <laughs> um, so I do not have slides, so don't, don't pay any attention. Um, I, I'm Mike Wilkening. I'm Undersecretary of Health and Human Services for the state of California. It's 12 departments in uh, ranging from social services, healthcare services, public health, are kind of the, the big departments there. Um, I would love to tell you that it, we have this really robust way of doing evidence-informed decision-making, and that would be a lie. Um, that's just not, not the way that things happen in California generally, um, at the state level anyway. Um, I'll also tell you that it's trying to change all of that is there, there are technological aspects of it and there are, there are cultural aspects of it and the technology is the easy part of this. Mm -hmm. The changing the culture of, of how we think about data and how we think about our programs is really the, the difficult part of this and I think at the state level it's even more difficult than at the city or county level, main reason being that we really don't have direct service providers at the state level. So you're more distant from the client, from the person that's actually receiving those services. And so if my, my departments are great at giving me summary statistics about their programs. They're even quite good at giving me those summary statistics at a departmental level. But if you want to just completely watch their heads blow off, you ask them about people. <laughs> and and they, they just, they short circuit. And, they, and then they go, well, well the people that are in the, the WIC program, right? I'm like, no, no, no. We're talking about across the different programs that we have. Um, it was a question that was posed back to me in 2008 when I first became undersecretary and California was going through a lot of reductions. We had to cut billions of dollars out of health and human services and um, really miserable process. We were cutting Medicaid, we were cutting in-home supportive services, TANF, um, just pretty much everything, developmental services. And so we had this really bad list of reductions that we, we came together on. Um, and the secretary, after a really, you know, it was like a two hour briefing that was really miserable for everybody involved, most importantly for me. Um, <laughs> she looked at me and she, and she said, so what's the cumulative effect? And I was like, oh, well, you know, it's, this many billions of dollars, and she said, no, no, no. How many, how many families were hitting like five times? And I said, no idea. Can't tell you. Um, I said, on average, I can generally work through it. You know, I can tell you that the average Medicaid recipient is a family of three, they have an income level of this, and so they're probably eligible for this level of TANF. They're probably also receiving this food benefit. And you can walk through on averages what that, that probably looks like, but 
we can't tell you really what that looks like for, for real people with real data. Um, sadly, I will say that we still can't. Um, though we're getting close, and that's where we're working with Emily over here, who's a researcher from USC, who is helping us to link our data systems together. Um, and that's the, the technology aspect of, of this, is, is trying to bring all of those disparate data sets together, get the, our systems to talk together, and, and really try to figure out what that is. But it's really trying to, to rethink, rather in t than in terms of programs, in terms of people. And that's really been the push that I've been making the last three, four years in the agency. Those of you that figured out I was appointed in 2008 when I had that miserable conversation with the secretary and three or four years ago started pushing this idea of person-centered and linking data. There's a gap in there and that's because I stayed as far away from IT as I possibly could um, and left it to the other undersecretary. And when he left, then it became mine again and I got to then start dealing with, with IT, uh, mainly around our procurements, which um, if you want true misery, try procuring a system in, in California state government. Um, we're, we're getting better at it. We're getting better at it. It's very painful. Um, so about three, or three going on four years ago, we, we did an open data portal. And so that's we first started putting our, our data out there. Um, that was that was a fun experience for my staff who got to convince me to, to do open data. Um, it was a, a remarkable um, example of miscommunication, which um, open data to an undersecretary is a very, very bad thing. Um, because open data, the only time that I dealt in data before this was when there were data breaches. And so when somebody says open data to me, I'm like, no, you need to keep that data closed, you need to keep it encrypted, you need to make sure that it's not getting in the hands of people that shouldn't have it. My folks then doubled down on this and started talking about hackers. And like, that was a good thing. And I was like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> you're about to get thrown out of my office. Um, so we, they finally convinced me that you know, open data was, was really a good thing. It was, there were not the, the risks that initially I thought there were, and that it was, we were focusing on non-HIPAA compliant data, non-personally identifiable information. Um, and then I was, I was all in. I was, all right, this, this makes sense now. Let's start thinking about how to do this. And um, so we started with, with an open data portal. We now have about 270 data sets up there, about 10,000 uh, hits per, per month on the site. It then got me thinking about, and going back to this question that had been posed by the prior secretary about our internal data and what are we doing with it and how can we better use it and what do we really have? Um, and so that's where we, we started thinking about that. We put together a data use agreement that took a long time, um, attorneys, uh, it, it's good to be able to tell them that the answer is yes, um, and then force them to, every time they came back with a problem and said, well, this isn't going to work, he said, oh, no, the answer is yes, now you get to go back and tell me how to get to yes, until you can really come back to, to me and tell me that it's illegal. But until you can say it's illegal, you need to just keep banging your head on a wall, cursing at me, and get me a data use agreement. So they finally did, they finally did. And in a director's meeting, I sent it around the table and got all 12 directors to, to sign it. Saying, so your, your people have already done this. You just need to sign, you know. So we have a data use agreement. We started using it. Um, it makes it much easier. It's the, the framework, basically, for sharing data across the 12 departments in Health and Human Services um, and gets us to that idea of we should be thinking about person-centered rather than program-centered and um, that we should be sharing. So we should really actually want to share information across the departments you know, for appropriate purposes and with the right protections in place, but we really shouldn't be siloed in our thinking about our programs because the people that we're serving aren't siloed. Our programs impact them in sometimes complementary and sometimes adverse ways, and we should know what's going on relative to those interventions that we're, we're funding and that we're providing. Um, 
we have de-identification de guidelines that we've, we've put into place so that we make sure that any information that we're putting out there is de-identified and that we aren't having problems with, and um, I brought it up earlier about if you put the information out, it's actually fairly easy to, to figure out how, you know, who somebody is depending on what information you're putting in there, um, especially if you start linking it up with other data sets, it becomes pretty easy. So um, we've had data scientists who've been working on the de-identification guidelines for us and, and we have that now so that we can start to share that information out publicly um, rather than just having internal. It's driven us um, to start thinking differently, both the idea of looking at the, the person and also looking at the information that we have to really think about what we're doing across the department. So we've, we started up an innovation office two years, two and a half years ago, um, actually just got a, a, a new director officially appointed, it had been one that I just kind of found through Fuse Corps and we were just kind of cobbling things together. We have an uh, innovation director that was appointed at the beginning of this week by the governor and so we actually are, have an innovation office. We don't have to staff it, but you know, we, we have the innovation office. <laughs> uh, we have a director. Um, all, we have three quarters of our departments are participating in use cases right now through, the, through that. And these are um, use cases looking at, at, they're generated by the departments. They come in with a problem. Say we, wanna, we have a problem with um, our enrollment in CalFresh, which is our SNAP program, and the women, infant, and children. We think there should be more overlap, but we don't really know what's going on with them. So we pulled the data sets together, start looking at how are we doing in the various counties and in WIC and, and CalFresh enrollments, um, pull that information together. We're providing that back out to the counties now at a census tract level so that they can use that information to tailor their outreach efforts um, and then also for uh, figuring out what best practices are so that we can use that across them. Um, we, in the, the fires that we recently had in California, um, my department's license or certify a lot of different types of, of facilities. And so in the Northern California fires, um, it took my folks two weeks to pull together a geomap for me of, of all the different facilities that we have and, and tell me what was going on with them, whether they were operating and, and fine, whether they were um, destroyed or if they were some, somewhere in between. And then what capacity did we have in the outlying areas? Now a lot of that's the actual response is a county level response, but at the state we need to have insights into what's going on and be able to help across counties and figure out where we need to be pushing and where we need to be focusing resources. So two weeks at that point, really not a great decision-making tool, um, pretty far into the fire. Um, we hit Southern California the second day of the fire. We had that same map up and we're providing it to the Office of Emergency Services so that everybody knew what was going on with our facilities, how many patients we had in those, those facilities, um, what the capacity was in the surrounding area. We were doing map, uh, geomapping with the, uh, the fire area from Cal Fire because we have all these unknowns. And so rather than in the Northern California, I had to send people out, told them, you know, in the car, put eyes on the facility, tell me if it still exists. When we got to Southern California, we were able to take the, the map of the fire region, overlay it with the map of our, our facilities, say, okay, those facilities that aren't answering the phone are in the burn area. They probably don't exist at this point. And then we could move on and not have the, the human resources, plus the fact that in that area, it's all impacted at that point. So having more people go in just confuses everything and makes it more difficult for the responders who actually need access to the roads and, and not have a bunch of people in there that need, they need to worry about. So we're in the middle of doing all of this. It's accelerating. I have more and more people that are, are getting excited about it. All of my departments at this point are, are excited about it. And we're about 11 months from a transition. So 11 months, will this administration will, will be gone. There will be a new administration that comes in. California, no big surprise it'll be a Democrat in all likelihood, but you know, 
um, not sure what they'll they'll do relative to all of these these efforts. So we've been focused on sustainability. Um, pro I've been focused on it from the time that we started doing this, but we've really ramped up the efforts in the last year probably. Um, <coughs> Really looking at, we have a governance structure that all 12 departments are participating on. I've never been to a governance meeting. I tell them it's not because I don't care. It's not because I don't think it'd be interesting. It's because you can't rely on me to, to push this agenda. So when I'm gone, some, some structure needs to be here that's moving this forward. And so you all need to run the governance structure and I get report outs from it and I'll engage on decision making coming out of that but I never go into one of their meetings and push, push it forward or tell them what they have to do. Um, we've been doing thing, building artifacts like an open data handbook. So when we first did the open data portal, uh, folks told me that you know we're going to start with the easy ones. So let us just put them up. I said no, that's that's not the way this is going to work. Instead, you're going to build a handbook and and we're going to lay out. How do you actually get a data set on here? Who needs to sign off on it? How often do you need to refresh? What are you doing with this? And then we'll, we'll do that. And if we mess it up on these first ones, I won't care because they're the easy data sets, the ones that it's not going to cause real problems if it goes sideways on us. Um, we're building the relationships with the, the research universities as well. And so I, I think. You know, there's a, there's a lot of promise in, in the policy labs. There's a lot of promise in the, in the poverty lab. And we're building relationships with, with those, with, with USC, with Stanford. Um, and earlier speakers talked about this. When, when I'm getting ready to present to a governor, or when a governor comes to me and says, you know, I, I want a child care proposal. It's not, I want a child care proposal for my reelection. It's, I want a child care proposal in the next month. And you then have to start scoping this out and trying to figure out how to do this in a very compressed time frame. Existing research is great. So if there's stuff that's been done already, my folks will grab it, they will look at it, they will say, okay, this is what we need to do. This is the evidence base that you have that exists. We don't then farm, we don't farm it out to other people. We have internal researchers that we can work with but I'm working with the research universities to get better training for those folks so that they're better able to do that job for me. Um, this is where I think the Policy Lab has promise as well, is trying to develop those relationships so that we have access to researchers in, that are working on tighter time frames. We're also trying to, to work on our data and how we provide that to people. So I think that, you know, from, from my perspective, there, there are buckets in this and it's, <coughs> I have needs that are short-term needs, that I need researchers who can turn things in a week. And those are generally going to be my folks and they need to be well-trained. On the other spectrum, we have the, the researchers at universities who are working on things that honestly I don't care about. Um, it's not, I'm not saying it in a bad way, but you know, it doesn't impact me in any way. It's some very esoteric thing that's going to make it into a journal that isn't going to do anything other than move towards tenure, um, which is a good thing, but does nothing for me in state government. And then there's that sweet spot in the middle where there are questions that the researchers care about and the state government cares about, and those are the ones where we need to actively partner. But I think that there's the, the continuum that we need to take into account, and as we do that, the research universities have people who can train. They can provide training to my folks, and I have data that they want on the other side, and I can provide them with that. So those are the types of things that we're, we're starting to, to work through now and hoping to, to get those in place before I leave. Thank you all. Great. Well, thank you to all of our panelists. I'm going to start with uh, one or two questions, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience. Um, and one thing that Anjali mentioned was the need to build champions across departments and then also at different levels. Um, so I'd be interested in more um, from all of you on the panel about how you have actually gone about doing that, um, both to get this work up and started, but also, as Mike mentioned, to ensure that you know when you leave office that all the good work that you've done doesn't leave with you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I think 
One of the things that we've, two things, is that in addition to just having the GovLab team membership be representative of a number of different departments, we've also had those departments lead certain programs or initiatives. So the revenue department is leading the book club. Um, no specific reason why they volunteer to do it, which is great. The Office of Open Data and Digital Transformation led the 10-month speaker series. The policy office leads the behavioral science experiments. And so it's like, you know, I have a staff of two, and there's no way that we would be able to meet all of those goals that we would want to meet. And so the, the idea is to really have our colleagues lead those programs, and, and we are one team um, promoting that. And um, I think that's all stuff there. Yeah, I think one of the things we've done in King County that's been effective is um, trying, you know, in terms of building more champions for the work is creating some um, communities of practice. So just um, getting folks who have an interest in, in, the, in a subject together across departments and um, leading discussion around that, very much like um, the book club that Anjali mentioned. And I think the other thing I'll add is that um, you know, there's there's almost nothing of real importance that government can do on its own. And so I've found that in addition to thinking about champions within government, it's also really important to find champions outside of government. So champions in the community, and those folks are going to be around, you know, regardless of who's the elected official. Um, and also, um, we've been, I think, pretty effective in finding champions um, in the business community, which is, um, you know, can kind of be unusual. And really leading with that outcome-oriented and data-led approach, I think, has really brought a lot of the business interests um, to the table with us to support things like a new tax to fund early childhood development. Um, we, we got some great quotes from... Um, our, our city government partners as well as our business community partners that, yes, they were kind of excited about investing in babies, everybody loves babies, um, but what they were really interested in was that this was kind of a new approach and that they wanted to invest in, and try that out. Yeah, I think, you know, we, we started out on the, the open data initiative. Um, I told, told my departments that they were all gonna participate, but I was gonna start with volunteers. And so we got the people that were most interested to, to step up first. Um, I, I did tell them at the end that when I ran out of volunteers, then we were going to start conscripting them. Um, and, and thankfully never got to that point. They really did all step up and, and they started to see value in it. And I think that that's part of what you have to build is this idea of value and why would I want to do this? So initially when I started doing these activities, I kept hearing, I've got too much to do. This, you know, I have a real job to do. Um, this thing's due here, and, and I was really trying to to step back and say, this actually is your job. I'm not giving you something new to do. I'm giving you a different way to do your job. But we're still talking about your job, and <laughs> <laughs> um, and so and, and actually, I'm, I'm giving you a tool to do your job better and to, to think differently about what it is that you're doing. But, you know, it, it's core to what you're supposed to be doing here. Um, and then as we've been doing the use cases and people have been getting insights into how their programs interact and what that means for people, they've, the interest has continued to go up. And so I think as you have those successes, that's, that builds your internal champion cohort. Um, and then uh, likewise, um, we've been working with, with the external as well, with, with groups like Code for America and Code for Sacramento, um, the research community, various ones to, to help bring in more expertise, but also give people insight into things that others are doing and what that partnership looks like because it's the same groups that are trying to make people's lives better. Something else that each of you mentioned um, is your work with researchers and uh, developing research partnerships and how you can find partnerships that are of mutual benefit both to the researchers and to the policymakers. Can you talk a little bit more about how you identify those opportunities for mutual interest and then also uh, make sure that 
sort of the upfront cost of building that relationship um, are worth the long-term investment in terms of the benefit that you get at the government side? Um, so we have two academic lead researchers. One is from the University of Pennsylvania and served as a fellow for Obama's social behavioral sciences team and is now at Penn. And um, our second lead researcher is at Swarthmore College. And the reason that they're leads is because it's not only them that are giving their time and their resources to specific projects, but they've also helped get Fells and the Lang Center support for us, so we've had two full-time fellows in the summer. Um, just again, an invaluable resource. And I think how we've—I don't quite remember how we found them at this point, but we did uh, hold a conference in 2016, our first year, um, and it was all academic researchers presenting to city department leaders on behavioral science and social sciences and how they can be applied in various contexts. And from that conference. There was 20 city agencies that stepped up and said, I, I'd like to talk more to a researcher and see if there's a possibility. And so it was through Dan and Sion, our two leads, that they kind of brought in more partners. And so now we are working with um, Penn, Temple, uh, St. Joe's, um, Drexel, Swarthmore, and Princeton. Um, but I think you know we're we're always open to speaking with a new researcher, sharing the kind of policy problems or challenges or questions that we have, and it's either going to be a connection right now or maybe later on. But we try to hold on to those relationships and check in every once in a while. And we have had a conference every year. Um, so coming up for 2018, our conference will be in October. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, to be frank, I think. Um, the relationship between government and academia has been pretty ad hoc. Um, a lot of it has depended on just personalities in government, in academia. There was a lot of, I thought, really great discussion on the earlier panel about a lot of the barriers to government and academia working better together. Um, that's been true in King County as well. We have a lot of activity actually going on between the county and the University of Washington. And one of the things that we're doing right now, actually, is trying to, um, there's nobody who really knows what all of that stuff is. And so we're actually in the process of working with the university and all of our departments to try to um, uh, pull together all of that activity that's happening. And I very much suspect that as we look at that, we're going to find ways where we can really be a lot more strategic. Um, I do think that um, um, you know there there are some things that we can do in government to shift uh, to develop better partnerships with academia, and I think one of those things is definitely really thinking much more seriously about developing uh, learning agendas. So again, if we can do a good job of setting out like what are the big questions we're really interested in trying to learn more about you know, on a longer time horizon, um, we're going to be able to influence and find better partners in academia to really be engaged with us, not just in kind of a, you know, transactional relationship, but really a true partnership. Um, and I think, you know, um, efforts like the Policy Lab, the work that JPAL is doing, um, I think those uh, sorts of ways to systematize and institutionalize the partnerships are really, really helpful. I, I would agree. I, that's what I was going to say. It's a it's been a transactional relationship yeah. for the most part, um, and so it's when when researchers need data or when we need an evaluation, and and then you just kind of have these these one offs for the most part, um, with some notable exceptions. And that's you know we've we've had a better relationship with USC because of the relationship that we have with with Emily, and that's. That's really kind of what I, I'm looking to change is that, you know, and I know when I start talking about the esoteric research, it probably doesn't help. It, it, it didn't, didn't help at Stanford either when I went after tenure. <laughs> so, um, but, you know, I, I think that it's, it's, it's really recognizing what, what people's interests are and that there is that sweet spot where you know, you do have professors that they, they don't want to just publish papers to publish papers, that they, 
Okay, I'm going to go after tenure again. <laughs> I, I, I think that, that tenure really pushes them into that mode of, of doing papers, getting them published in journals that quite often don't have a lot of relevance to, to actual real world problems. And so your junior faculty spend a lot of time doing that. And it's not until they become tenured that they actually have that that freedom to then engage. And they, they flat out told me this I mean, at Stanford when I was there, because it was just, they said, you know, I said, you, you have junior faculty members. Why can't I have access to them? Well, they need to publish. And so it's it's this inherent value that, that the university places on publications versus solving real problems. And I think there's a better way to do that. I, I do think that there's a happy medium there where solving real world problems should actually count for something as you're thinking about who gets tenured. But again, I'm, I'm not a university president or provost and at this point never will be. Um, but I think that you, we need to figure out those sweet spots where the professors really do want to, to solve problems. They want to do things that matter and we have needs and we're all trying to get to the same place and we just need to, to build the relationships so we can get there rather than just transacting over, over an evaluation that's quite often done, figured out after you've already done the program and we don't have good data and we don't get a good evaluation because we didn't do a good job of figuring out what we wanted before we implemented a program. And your staff are never really engaged with the academic in doing right. it, so you just get this report delivered, which then we all know what happens to those points. They're, they're mad. They're delivered. actually mad yeah. about the evaluation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's that creating that more engaged process. Yeah. Great. Uh, we have time now so for some questions from the audience. I'm going to pass the mic over to you, <clears throat> Todd, and then he'll come and find you. <coughs> All right. Um, I am trying to think of a nice way of putting this. Um, so, uh, why, one of the issues with working with these long time scale experiments or whatever is that sometimes you do have turnover with management. Um, and so, the people who have to implement these things are sort of rank and file people. Um, who sometimes don't regard it as their job to do this innovative stuff. Um, and so I was wondering if any of you guys have any good examples of ways in which we can motivate people to expand the scope of what they regard as their job and get excited about things like this. We've done a couple things and it's, I don't know if it's because people have not been excited about it, but maybe sometimes don't understand it or don't see themselves in the work. Um, for our champions, our departmental folks that got involved, I think this is this is small, although it's not small. When we launched our Twitter account, GovLab PHL, we wanted to not only recognize the work that's being done, but also the people that are a part of the work. And so we created a strategy around GovLab champs. And so different departmental folks get highlighted, they get their picture taken, we ask them for some fun facts about themselves that are not work related, and we highlight them, that they are integral to this process. And I think for some, what that's done is really created a little bit more investment, um, more public investment, and so they've come back with new ideas. I think another example, we had one particular um, employee in the Department of Revenue that really wasn't engaging and they were managing a big project but just didn't want to like really engage and so we um, asked them to present to upper level management about exactly what they were doing and the challenges that they were facing and it created just a new dialogue. I think if that ha opportunity hadn't been there, she may not have never needed to really present to upper level management at all or had that opportunity but um, we created the opportunity so I think it, it's that might be one way. Um, we also host a quarterly administration-wide policy meeting, and again, it's not just upper-level management reciting news and things that have happened, but we ask departments to come up and share, you know, you have three minutes, tell your colleagues about something neat that you're doing, and, it, and at first nobody wanted to stand up and share, and so we, the mayor's office did do the whole meeting. But by our third meeting, people really got a little bit more comfortable, and now we have a wait list for the number of people that want to get up and share. So we weren't doing 
quarterly policy meetings before. I think it's just a matter of like creating something where people get a chance to voice their thoughts about a new process or. Yeah, I, it's really about culture change in an organization, which is never easy and it takes a long time. And I do think that this view of, you know, evidence-based policy making like that term rather than evidence-informed decision making really tends to exclude a lot of people. Um, and taking that broader full cycle view of, gosh, there's a lot of new skills and competencies we need to start applying in government um, across that whole cycle brings everybody in your um, <clears throat> everybody in your organization into the into the process. Um, one of the things that I think has helped us in in King County really bring a lot more attention around um, the use of data and decision making is we have this thing called tier boards and rounding, and um, Josephine for sure can can talk to you a lot about that. Um, <laughs> But it basically, it's borrowing from um, um, the hospital example of doctors doing roundings. And um, we've asked every one of our departments, um, and it cascades from our executive office where we have those big goals that I laid out, and we have like generated the indicators and the measures that we want to track related to those goals. Um, and then it, it flows down to our, at our department level and our division level. Everybody's got a big whiteboard that um, we spend time really thinking about what's the data that we need to track to help us, you know, make sure we're staying on target and, and um, making good decisions and course correcting and adjusting. And I think just having that kind of visual cue for people, um, and people get kind of excited, right? Like they own their board and they get to like develop their own board. Um, so they feel a lot more ownership over it. And we just actually published a little guide, um, like kind of a fun visual guide about how we've done that in King County, and um, happy to share that share that with people. But it's just one way of creating that culture change, and I think that's going to be a little bit different in every organization. And, and what I found is that our newer staff um, are really excited when they start hearing that we're doing something different, that we aren't approaching government the same way that we we've always approached it. Um, that we're looking for them to be creative, that we want to do things differently. Um, the challenge for us really has been, it's a 30,000 person organization across 12 departments and trying to get that information throughout the, the agency is really difficult. <coughs> and so we, you know, we, we've started trying different ways to, to get that out there and to start highlighting the successes that we're seeing and to really show that we, we are committed to a different way of doing it. Uh, because quite often we find that you know people have the skill sets or they have that approach already in mind. They just feel that if they spoke up that they were just gonna get beat down, that you know nobody was gonna listen to them. We were just going to keep doing things the way we always have. And once they, they realize that we actually are open to it that I found people really embracing and coming up with really great ideas and it it tends to cascade but we need to do a better job of getting it broadly out across the the state agency um, any other questions we're standing between everyone and cocktails. <laughs> All right. No, don't want to be in that position. <laughs> All right. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.